Welcome to the Gospel and Acts. It's wonderful to be here again tonight and just to share from God's Word. Uh, we're coming in for a landing as far as the book of Luke is concerned. And I don't know about you, but I've learned such a lot. I mean, personally, I've learned such a lot. And the Holy Spirit's just been sharing with my heart. And even tonight's lecture, again, I believe is going to be a blessing for all of us. So open your heart and receive tonight what the Holy Spirit wants to say to you. Tonight's lecture, we're at 3.6. And the heading for tonight is The Seeking Savior. The objective tonight is to understand the kind of heart that can receive God's mercy and to learn what Jesus taught about repentance. So jumping straight into the lecture tonight, we are talking about a beautiful story of healing. And you will find the story of the man or the demoniac in Gennesareth in Luke chapter 8, verse 26 to 39. They sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but he had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and he fell at his feet shouting at the top of his voice what do you want with me jesus son of the most high god i beg you do not torture me verse 29 for jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man many times it seized him and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under god he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. So, just look at what a demon does to somebody. Now, I don't know who of you are demon-possessed tonight. Okay. <laughs> Listen, it's, uh, we were at a pastor's conference and uh, two demons manifested amongst the pastors. So, it's, it is quite a possibility, but not probable but possible but look at what this demon did to this man the demon isolated him it made him take off all his clothes in the other version in uh, another gospel it actually says that he cut himself with stones not with knives with stones he lived amongst the tombs and he had supernatural human strength because as we know from what we read, there was a legion of demons inside of this man. And just think of today even in society, where people do have demons. People are demon possessed. People are demon oppressed. And some people are just controlled by evil spirits. Because of the fact that we are being more and more infiltrated and contaminated by evil spirits. And what we see here is what the devil does is exactly what John 10.10 10 says. He's come to steal, kill and destroy. He was stealing this man's life. This man had no life. I mean, who in his right mind wants to live amongst tombs naked? Who in his right mind wants to cut himself with stones in the other gospel, it says that he was crying out all the time, screaming the whole night in agony. So what we need to understand from this, I think, is number one, that we need to be in a position where we can discern and assist those who are suffering under demonic oppression or possession. The church of Jesus Christ is the solution. If Jesus didn't come to this particular place at this particular time, this man would have had a life of suffering and then death. But because Jesus came there, he was the light, and the light could push back and expel the darkness. We have the same function today. And whether it is, you know, utter demon possession, oppression, or whether it is even a manifestation of addiction, 
where people have cycles of addiction or very de destructive behavior, the church of Jesus Christ is the answer. We are the answer. Not ourselves, but Christ in us is the answer. We're supposed to have a response towards things like that. Many times, and I know some of you guys are in the deliverance ministry, but my father-in-law was involved in deliverance ministry years uh, ago. There was a prophecy uh, over his life about deliverance ministry. And many people would go from church to church or from pastor to pastor until they finally got to him where he could pray for them and where they were set free. And many of those people, after they were set free, their entire lives changed. Their entire lives changed. It's a day and night situation. And for us it's the same. Because as we consider this story, we see that Jesus delivered this man. And then the man actually begged Jesus and said, I want to go with you. And Jesus would say to one person, come and follow me. And to another person, he would say, no, don't follow me. He knew exactly what to say to who. Not everybody is supposed to be in your church, in your specific church, in your uh, local expression of the kingdom. You have to understand that. Not everybody is supposed to journey with you. Not everybody is supposed to come to Bible school. Not everybody is supposed to go to healing school or deliverance school. Or God has a divine purpose for every single person and you need to hear what that is. But the fact is you need to play a part. There are no passenger seats on the kingdom bus. Many Christians have this idea now that you can be saved, join a church, Become a church member, and you've done your job. It's not like that. You get born again, spirit-filled, you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you follow your master where he leads you. And then he will tell you that freely you've received, and now freely you're going to give. But Jesus knew exactly so he told this man in verse 39, he said to him, No, no, don't come with me. Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over the town how much Jesus had done for him. This man, who is a miracle of Jesus, is now a missionary of Jesus. To those in his own hometown who know him best. Now I know that a prophet is normally not honored in his own house. But you have to understand one thing. The testimony is honored. You understand what I'm saying? Those people know you. Those people, they've seen you. I was a drug addict. I came to Christ. And my family, they were fully aware of the miracle that was taking place in my life because they saw the change. So... The fact that it, it was a deliverance was evident to the family. So they saw it. Yes, many of my family don't necessarily follow me as a disciple, although my mother says I'm a pastor. Uh, but many of them don't follow me as a disciple be, because they don't necessarily have respect for my ministry. Like you sitting here tonight, you're listening to the word, but... Some of my family might not sit here and want to listen to the word because I'm just richer to them. To you listening and online, it's different because you don't know me. You can then have faith. And as you have faith and you receive God's word with faith and you listen with faith, the Holy Spirit starts functioning and then you receiving because you have an expectation. Jesus couldn't do miracles in his hometown because the people didn't believe. Because they said, isn't this the son of Joseph, the son of Mary, the carpenter's son? Don't we see his brothers and his sisters here? But this was different because here you've got this demoniac who was manifesting for we don't know how long. All the people knew it. These demons went into the pigs. The pigs went off the hill 
And the herders that looked after the pigs went to the town. They said to the people, come and check what's happening here. When the people came out, they were very shocked to see all the pigs in the ocean, you know, lying on lilos. No. <laughs> no. No. They were with cigarettes in the mouth and no, just those, those demon pigs. But they were all dead. <laughs> and then they were very surprised to see this man sitting fully clothed and in his right mind. And that's why Jesus said, listen, you go home. And you will, when you read this section, you will see the people actually asked Jesus at this stage to go. Uh, they were afraid. You can, you can read that in the previous verse. And then the people came out to see what had happened in verse 35. And they found the man sitting there at the feet of Jesus, dressed in his right mind. And then in verse 37, then all the people of the region asked Jesus to leave. They wanted him to leave. Now, we don't fully understand whether, you know, they were just very scared because this was such a supernatural manifestation or whether they were also demon-possessed and they just want, didn't want the demons to come out of them. <laughs> and all the piggies, this little piggy went to market. I mean, if he had to send all those demons into all the pigs, they probably wouldn't have food left. But they asked him to leave. But then Jesus obviously didn't want to stay, but he then said to the man in verse 39, you return and you go and tell. And uh, in verse 39, he actually returned home and he, he was testifying. So what is the personal application of this? This gives us a definition of a missionary. If God has done great things for you, then you are a missionary. You are like a candle on a stick. Remember that? You're like a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. So we are to show and tell the great things that God has done for us. This missionary assignment is to begin with where it is the hardest and where we are the best known. And that is in our own homes. That's where this missionary assignment starts. I discovered something interesting. If you look at the timeline of Mark, you will see something very significant about this whole event. Jesus goes to this region, delivers this man, and then sends this man to go and testify. When Jesus' ship lands in the region again, here in Mark chapter 6, verse 53, it says, When they had crossed over, they landed at Gennesareth and anchored there. In verse 54, as soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. Now, why did they recognize him? Why did the people there recognize Jesus? Because of the previous incident. He was there already. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into the villages, Towns and countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplace. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. Now, what changed here? As far as I can understand, looking at the Mark timeline and looking at the incident, something shifted in the spiritual. So we can assume that this demoniac was a missionary and he was spreading the word and there was an expectation and when Jesus got off the ship the second time the people had an expectation and that expectation led to signs, miracles and wonders the opposite is true in Nazareth which was on the other side of the lake in his hometown, Nazareth, the Bible says, some of the Gospels say that he, he couldn't do any miracles. Um, on the, the one scripture says he could only do a few miracles. But the fact is he was limited because of what? Unbelief. Again, a lesson for us in our lives. You, you can't rise above your belief system. You have to believe it to receive it. It's a kingdom principle. 
If you don't believe it, even if it's a promise, even if it's been allocated to you, even if it's part of your inheritance, you can't access it. Because it's accessed by faith. Faith is the key that unlocks the door to the new covenant blessing. And the fact is that we need to stir ourselves up, build ourselves up, and actually get faith escalating in our lives, growing in our lives. How do we get faith? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You're getting faith tonight as you are listening to me. It takes a certain level of faith for the believer to access certain things in the kingdom. You have to understand the difference of anointings. You've got the Shekinah glory of God, the manifestation of the anointing when the gift of healing is operating. And then people are healed. There was this guy in India that was ministering there and as he was busy preaching the word, this young Indian boy who couldn't walk, who was crippled from birth, just jumped up and started walking because of the manifestation. But then you get somebody in South Africa who's sitting in a church and they are fighting something in their own bodies or they are praying for each other for healing and then they have to receive the healing by faith. By their faith. The righteous will live by their faith. So we have to acquire by faith what has been provided by grace. And what we see here is faith. Because when an atmosphere is filled with faith, filled with expectation, you see transformation. You see impartation. You see the glory of God manifest into that situation into the atmosphere i always say when i looked at revival revival when i experienced revival in our ministry when god started moving in a very supernatural and awesome way it was not because of anything we did it was not because of anything god sent but it was because of a change of expectation because you could see that in in attendance you could see that in uh, the, the punctuality. I mean, people were waiting at the services a half an hour before the services. Before revival, they were coming 20 minutes, 15 minutes after the services. Bef when revival occurred, they were there before the services because there was this excitement, this expectation, and that placed a demand on the power. Because faith places a demand on heavenly power. Me heavenly power manifests as faith accesses it. You, are, you understand that? It's like this woman who's pushing through the crowd. There were many people touching Jesus. There were many people sick. But this woman got healed because she thought to herself, if only I touch the hem of his garment, I would be whole. And exactly what she thought occurred. Amen. Amen. Now, this is a painful one for the church. Are you the guy in the front or are you the guy in the back? The Pharisee and the publican. Luke chapter 18, verse 9 to 10. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable. So who's this parable for? Say it's for me. <laughs> Who is this parable for? Who is self-righteous? Very religious, very self-righteous. Thank you. for you so we can feel Jesus die. Two men went to the temple to pray, one Pharisee and one tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. So he's praying about himself. God, I thank you. He's praising God. You know, he's worshipping. I thank you that I'm not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all I get. 
But then in verse 13 it says, The tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Then Jesus says, I tell you the truth that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. What can we learn from this? Always be humble, yes? If you humble yourself, God will lift you up, yes? Yes? Anything else? God protects the self-righteous. Yeah, the prideful. The prideful, yes. Yeah. yeah. He rejects the prideful and He gives grace to the humble. He admits he's a sinner. Yeah. Yes. Repent. Yes. You see, it depends on a lot of times your history. A lot of people come from a religious family and they've been good people. They've been, generally speaking, good people. And they've kept the commandments they've obeyed the Lord, they've never gone astray. For those people, a lot of times, their good behavior seems for them a great benefit. So they feel that they are quite confident in the fact that they've actually done what they're supposed to do. Then you get the opposite. You know, the people who come from drugs and from addiction and from uh, a sinful lifestyle and they know that it's by grace that they come. But a lot of times, unfortunately, a lot of people are religious and they don't understand that the best and the worst still needs grace because it's, it's by the accomplishment of the cross. It's not by our own performance. So even the best thing we do in ourselves is still stink in terms of the spiritual it's not enough it's not good enough so there's nothing we can do we are saved by grace through faith so we believe and we receive and then we are saved unto fruit good works so the manifestation of those good things in our lives it's actually because we are abiding in the vine God is working in us to will and to do according to His purpose. So the manifestation of, of His goodness is fruit. But us doing things for justification is error. Even if it's a good thing. Even if we can commit ourselves to certain things. It's great to have spiritual discipline. Don't get me wrong. But if we see spiritual discipline as a root to elevation or seniority. In other words, because we pray two hours a day, we are now better than somebody else. Because we can read our Bible three times a day, or we can study the Bible, or we can sit in church every Sunday, every Wednesday, every Monday, we are now better than somebody else. We're making the same mistake here. We can do those things, but for the right reasons. To receive from the Lord. To grow in the Lord. And we should do those things because they should naturally come as a manifestation of an inward condition. So here we have two men, two prayers and two postures and then two pronouncements. The important thing about these two men is that at the end of the story, the one of them was declared by Jesus justified. And you know what the word justified means? Well, the Greek word is actually dekaio. And you will see something interesting if you look at a study of that word. 
if you look at Romans, you will see that Paul talks about the justification by grace, the doctrine of justification by grace is actually wonderfully exp explained in the book of Romans. That's also why you will see that you've got 14 occurrences of, of that word in Romans only. Of the 40 in the Bible, you've got 14 in, in the book of Romans. So that is interesting, but like you said, the word justification means just as if I had never sinned. Now just think of that. That in itself is something that we battle with, especially if we've come from a very difficult background where you've done a lot of things. I'll never forget when I came to the Lord and I received Jesus as, as Lord and Savior. Now, you, you must remember that I sold drugs. Uh, I broke into places. I stole. I shoplifted. I sold other people's stuff. I fought. I hurt people. Uh, I did all of those things and I used drugs and I used alcohol and all of that. I even sold drugs to kids. And now all of a sudden I received Jesus. I had this tremendous revelation of God's grace. And I stood up from that chair feeling justified. And it wasn't by necessarily persuasion or doctrine it was by revelation i could feel and sense the forgiveness of god i could sense that joy upon my life and i experienced that freedom that liberty of total forgiveness and you know what happened then to me christians came to me afterwards and started overcomplicating my life because christian brothers and sisters well-meaning brothers and sisters came to me and they asked me if I had gone back and if I had fixed th certain things or if I had spoken to people or if I had done this or if I had done that. Now, a lot of times there's something you can do which we will see in the next story. There are things you can do. But in my case, there was really nothing I could do because most of the people that I sold drugs to they were still on drugs. Most of the people I stole from, I didn't even know where they were. or I didn't even remember a lot of times what I stole. So I just wanted to experience that grace. And I just wanted to experience the acceptance of God because I never felt accepted. You know, when you're a drug addict and you're doing drugs, you're pushed out by society for good reason. But still, you pushed out. Nobody wants you close to their kids. No fathers want you close to their daughters. And everybody's pushing you out. Wherever you go, you feel rejected. And you're already using drugs because you feel so rejected. And now, you come into the church, and then you have sometimes similar issues because you have almost like a religious uh, group of people who feel that you now have to pay penance in a certain sense where you have to actually go and fix everything. Now, like I say, there are times when, you, when the Lord will lead you to go and fix something, especially if you've got existing battles with people and if you've stolen from people and it's in your power to actually repay them. But I felt just as if I had never sinned. And I remember those feelings for those first few months of that kind of joy that I experienced. So the next parable we want to discuss is actually interesting in Zacchaeus, an African Zacchaeus. I had to uh, find out what the English word was. It's Zacchaeus. So what do you know about Zacchaeus? I don't know boom I had me gerook het en hom <laughs> so there are people who believe or theologians that actually believe that Zacchaeus was possibly the publican praying for justification because Jesus tells this just before he 
visits Jericho briefly. He's actually going through Jericho. He's not going to stay in Jericho, but he's just going through Jericho. And there are many people that actually believe that Zacchaeus was that publican in the parable that he had just uh, told them just prior to the event. Uh, an indication, uh, possibly, that this man was crying out for mercy. And uh, his heart was right before God. Now, if you look at Luke 18, you will see it starts with prayer. So, Jesus first tells the parable of the persistent widow. And if you read, read it, it says that he told this parable so that people will know to always pray and never give up. Those two things, the, the consistency of prayer and the persistency of prayer, where you must always pray and never give up. It's a great message. And then we've got the second parable of the two, of how you pray. So it's more about approaching God in His righteousness. And then if you look at the Greek word for prayer, that is actually 127 times in the Bible, derivatives of this word, it is divided in two uh, words, or two separate words. I did a study of this proshesh, and if you look at that word, the, the pros uh, talks about leaning in. It talks about moving towards. It's also the same word that it's used in John 1 when it says the word was with God. It talks about that intimacy. Another translation for that word in that scripture is uh, was face to face with God. Because in the original Greek it has this uh, almost suggestion of leaning in for a kiss. Of intimacy which is actually powerful so that first part of it talks about our attitude in prayer where we go and we pray and we approaching God with the central purpose of intimacy relationship we do petitions I mean we do petition heaven all of those things but our primary concern with prayer according to the original Greek is to lean in so when you pray in the mornings or whenever you pray at night you should really consider that that you don't just come with your prayer list but that you come to spend time with God in intimacy the reason I'm saying this is because the second part of the word the ish part it talks about the desire, it talks about prayer, it talks about a vow. In fact, in the original context, the individual would vow to give something of great value to God in exchange for a favorable answer to prayer. So, the only thing we can bring in this situation as we lean in is to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. So we're coming in prayer, first of all, to lay ourselves down. We're leaning in with the consciousness of the new covenant connection. The connection that we have with God. Because remember, the restoration has taken place. Heaven is open. The veil tore. We're walking straight into the most holy place, standing at the Ark of the Covenant, leaning in for fellowship. And like this tax collector not coming in our own righteousness but understanding that there's nothing we can do to earn it and there's actually nothing we can do to lose it so god doesn't look at our good works and he doesn't look at our sin he sees us in christ and we are coming in the context of being in christ not found with a righteousness of our own which is by the law or by works but a righteousness that comes by faith in Christ Jesus. So faith in the work and the finished work of the cross. And what we're saying is that this Zacchaeus was probably praying that prayer. And Jesus knows, I'm just going through Jericho. 
So I don't have a lot of time there. So in Luke 19, 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man by the name of Zacchaeus, he was the chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being short, he could not. So what did he do? He ran and he climbed in a sycamore tree. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he saw him and he said, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. And all the people that saw this began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. You see, man judges by what he sees. And especially from the religious community, they were looking at the outward appearance. They didn't know that an inward transformation had already started in Sergei's heart. It was just about to manifest. The desire that he had to see Christ, to be with Christ, that desire was a drawing of the Holy Spirit upon his life. And that had already started in his life. And Jesus knew exactly what he was doing. Because look at verse 8. Zacchaeus stood up and he said, Look here, Lord, now I give half of all my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay them back four times, 400%. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abram. Then he makes a very profound statement in Luke 19.10 For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Remember the parables of the lost things or the parable of lost things that we spoke about. All those different lost things. Yeah, it's a reiteration again of his manifesto, of his purpose. That's why we have to understand when we co-mission with Jesus, we have to co-mission with Him. He's not co-missioning with us. We have to understand this mission. We have to understand that He will reach out His hand into the darkest pit and pull out somebody from that pit. And then the miracle starts taking place. Now you can just imagine... Well, maybe you can't imagine, but try and imagine a chief tax collector. Which means this guy is the head of the tax collectors. The tax collectors collecting money from the Jewish people who are oppressed by the Romans to fund the Roman government's expenses. They were hated. They were normally Jews who were working for the Roman government. And they were hated. And according to Zacchaeus' own admission, he was stealing from people. He was overcharging them and stealing from them. Now imagine this guy coming and saying, listen, I'm giving half that I have, everything I have, half of it, I'm giving it away. There's a contrast between him and the rich young ruler that we spoke about. Remember the rich young ruler we spoke about? He had done everything right. He had kept all the commandments. He did everything right. And Jesus said, okay, you've done everything. So go and sell what you have and follow me. Give it to the poor. And the man went away sad. Remember what we said about that. Now, I mean, you can look at the strategy of Jesus in this interview. He's only passing through Jericho. So he's reaching a man who can impact the city. Try to imagine the impact on the city when Zacchaeus started calling the people in that he had overtaxed. Because this carried on. Jesus left. This carried on. So he was calling people in. They were expecting that they were going to get overcharged or maybe charged some more. And he said, no, listen. I overcharged you the last time. I'm counting out your money. You see... If Jesus has your heart, then 
you can't you cannot give your heart to anything else but there are a lot of things that's going to try and take your heart the same happened when they entered into the promised land because they were warned that when you get into the promised land and it's going good with you and you you eating the good of the land and you're receiving all the blessing don't let that then become the center of your life because we tend to lose perspective as far as eternity is concerned we think Zacchaeus paid a tremendous price here I mean he gave half that he uh, that he had away so he, he cut his wealth in half and then he started paying everybody 400 percent four times more than he had stolen from them and and he started depleting all the earthly wealth but that earthly wealth is actually nothing in terms of heavenly treasure we lose perspective because this world and the system tries to tell us that wealth is the most important thing the house you live in the car you drive and in the scope of eternity i mean those things are nice to have you on earth but in the scope of eternity it really doesn't matter it really doesn't matter we spoke about lazarus and the rich man in a previous lecture as well imagine their surprise joy and awe when they thinking he was going to get into their purses even deeper only to discover that he only wanted to pay them back four times and as i said it's a great contrast with the rich young man or the rich young ruler we find in luke 18 uh, 18 to 27 because this man actually was in normal human terms a good man he had done everything right he had kept the commandments he had kept the law he loved the lord but it seems like he loved wealth more and we have to really test our hearts all of us we get to that position where we face that test what is really number one in your life what is really the most important in your life in fact i think the christian life is frequently going through that same test especially when things go wrong and when you fail or when things don't work out the way you thought they were going to work out or you planned them it's easy for us to actually then get to that point where we we can murmur i mean the lord said to israel i led you into the desert to actually see what was in your heart that's the only reason so the desert actually manifested their heart so tonight we we are faced with a few questions as we consider what we see from Genazareth we see that we have to be the light we have to be the salt from both ends of that conversation because the one where we are faced with people who need deliverance who need help they need the answer and if we don't live it we can't give it we can't give what we don't have so we have to be able to release that healing on the other side we see the man when he receives it he then goes back and he's supposed to then spread it and share that testimony which prepares people's hearts to receive from god because when you're sharing a testimony you are basically saying do it again which then stirs up faith in the hearer to actually receive from the lord and sometimes it's only by that testimony that somebody will receive you will see a lot of times in healing services when one person is healed many others start receiving especially when it comes to dreaded diseases like cancer or something like that which a lot of people you know they they have a hassle believing that so when cancer is healed then other people with cancer they draw hope from that from that testimony and they then start standing upon god's word then we have the publican and the pharisee praying and there we can look at it and ask ourselves the question 
are we coming in our own righteousness? And when we look at Luke 18, we ask ourselves a question, are we coming frequently and persistently? Has our lives become like the widow? Has it become a constant prayer? Not religious, but relational, where we communicate with our Father. Are we looking at that Greek word and are we capable of leaning in with our sacrifice? Or are we coming with agendas and motives and sophisticated language? I'm not saying you can't use sophisticated language if that is your way. I mean, you might be able to use sophisticated language in humility. But I'm saying that there's a specific pattern that's established even if we're looking at the Greek and we're considering this. I've always seen myself, in all honesty, as the publican standing in the back. Because I've never felt that there's anything good that lives in my natural body. I have sinned too much. I have failed too much to believe that I can come in my own righteousness and my own goodness. It's like Paul cries out in Romans, again talking about Romans, he cries out, wretched man, who will deliver me from this body when he says, when I want to do good, bad is right there. Now in the church, we don't like admitting that because we want to have a bit of an image. You know? But this specific parable or occurrence, if, if it's about Zacchaeus, is about the posture with which we come. The prayer, Lord forgive me. I know that in my natural man I'm not good enough. And to remain in that humble posture so that we can remain in the grace of God and depend upon that grace. And then with Zacchaeus again we can just see God's absolute wisdom and His absolute grace as He reaches out. And then those people who had a concern about the rich, which the disciples said to Jesus uh, when it came to the rich young ruler, they said to Him, if that is the case, who's going to be saved? Because then it's impossible for people to be saved, especially for those who have wealth. Well, Jesus said, nothing is impossible with God. It might be impossible with man, but with God it is not impossible. Now, I saw this. I saw this very manifestation so many times in my own life when God saved me, but then also in other people's lives. I'll never forget the priest of the Church of Satan in George was uh, my, my brother's employer. My brother worked for him. And my mother was a witch. So... She was heavily involved in the occult and tied up in occultic stuff. So I knew, by family association, I knew this guy was a, a priest in the Church of Satan. So I was still very young and, and we had a cell church the one Wednesday night. And we were praying. And that night uh, I felt that the Lord really laid this guy upon my heart. In my mind I felt that why would I pray for this guy? I mean, he, he's given his whole life over to Satan. They're doing sacrifices at the George Dam here. They were doing rituals. He told me afterwards they were, do, they were doing sacrifices. And um, I thought to myself in my mind that why am I praying for this guy? But that night it was as if the Holy Spirit started doing something. And we just started praying. And he told me later, because I went to actually go see him in hospital. That night, he had a slight meltdown uh, with demonic and dark forces. And he actually tried to take his own life. And he tried to kill himself. And he ended up in hospital. And then he ended up receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. And then he was totally set free. And uh, the Lord started using him across the country where he started ministering and, and sharing his testimony. 
and such a beacon of hope for those who are stuck, even now, stuck in occultic practices. Just to say that you can see how the Lord just reaches in like He did here, in this case with this chief of the tax collectors, chief of the publicans, biggest sinner. He comes and He reaches in and He, he sets them free. It's the same with the Gerasian. He sets them free. And that is what we are supposed to do now. Because remember, who's the body of Christ now? Yeah. Jesus doesn't have a body on earth anymore in the sense of Jesus walking around. But He has a body on earth now. And who's that body? Us. And where is that body located? It's across every nation, every country, every tribe. That body is located. It's a spiritual body. It's a kingdom of power. It's an unseen kingdom, but it's a kingdom of power. And that kingdom directly impacts darkness wherever it moves. And we are part of that kingdom. Amen. 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 Amen.